Hello to my friends joining us via recording. We are gonna talk about lesson number six today, but before we do, we're gonna go through and do a little bit of review from lesson number five. So we started our session today uh, in a group talking through some of the big ideas from lesson number five. So let's go through and look at these questions together. By the way, when you are studying, um, these kinds of questions are some of the things that are, are kind of like the big pictures from lesson number five. So um, I know we had some chatter when we were working on this, um, whether or not we understood the, the lesson in this way. This might be a good way to think about studying the lesson because uh, these are some of the big highlights. It's not everything, but it, it's some of the big things from that lesson. So the first thing uh, is a term that you may not have had on the, the guided lesson or on your notes, but it's a term we used in our live session together. So there's this word when we talk about building big things, uh, big things like a protein, that's a big thing. Uh, this word that we use is called a monomer. So a monomer is a small piece or it's the building block of something. So when we talk about proteins, we're absolutely right that the small pieces, the things that I connect together to make proteins are amino acids. So when I use this word monomer, remember it, it means small piece um, because we build together. Let me add, add the word for us over here. When we put together a bunch of monomers, we build something called a polymer. So a polymer is when I put a lot of things together. When you think about proteins, they're a polymer. Um, some other polymers that we have in the body, one that we're going to talk about today a lot, are nucleic acids. Uh, we also have, I'm going to put in a little slightly different place, another polymer are lipids. And uh, my final polymer are carbohydrates. So just toss that out, you, that, out for you, uh, that word polymer. Um, our, our four polymers in the body are proteins, they're carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids. Hey, I'll, I'll add a note for us. Here's a little bit of a, a preview for today's class. When we talk about the polymer that is nucleic acids, so the, the, the big macromolecule that, that stores your genetic information, we would say the monomer of nucleic acids are things called nucleotides. So nucleotides are the little pieces that I put together to build nucleic acids. So here's our, our polymer from today's lesson, nucleic acids. Last lesson, we talked about proteins and their monomer were those amino acids. So 100% right on this here. Next question asks you about the special kind of bond that we only find in proteins. If you remember from our, our live session last week, I told you to think of it kind of as, as a trigger word for you. Anytime you hear peptide bonds, you're thinking protein. This part here, peptide, means protein. So the chemical bonds that I only find in proteins, that I, I don't find in nucleic acids, or in carbohydrates, or in lipids, that special kind of bond is called peptide bonds. And those peptide bonds are what I use to build my primary structure. So if we look over at our picture here, there is a three-part picture that, that reminds us what's going on with proteins. This first part of the picture, I didn't ask you any questions on, but we could have said that each of these little dots that we see right here, each of these are the monomers of a protein. So each of these represent an amino acid that I see here. There's no protein structure going on in image A because image A isn't actually a protein. It's just a group of amino acids. But when I connect them to each other, like we see here in image B, when I put those peptides in between, now I've created a protein. So I've got primary structure going on here, amino acids in a line. That's their primary structure. We actually had some really great debate about what kind of structure we see here uh, in, in image C. So what we landed on was tertiary structure. Um, remind me in the chat, when we talk about tertiary structure, what does tertiary structure of a protein actually mean? What is a protein's tertiary structure? Yeah, so when, when we talk about tertiary structure, that does mean the, the 3D shape, right? So tertiary structure, I'm gonna add a little note for us here. 3D shape, 
Now, how is tertiary structure different from quaternary structure? Because we were talking about that one too. What's going on with quaternary structure? Quaternary structure. Yeah, so uh, pointing out in the chat here, quaternary structure, it's also 3D shape, but the biggest difference is I have to have more than one amino acid chain. Quaternary structure, I need to have more than one amino acid chain. Hey, I got this question via email multiple times, so let me just toss this out there. The hemoglobin is one example of a protein that has quaternary structure, but it is not by any means the only protein with quaternary structure. It's one example of a protein that's made of more than one amino acid chain, but pretty much every protein that does important jobs in your body is has quaternary structure. Pretty much all of our proteins need more than one amino acid chain. So keep in mind, uh, today we're gonna talk about a protein called RNA polymerase. That's another protein that has quaternary structure, meaning it has more than one amino acid chain. Hemoglobin, more than one amino acid chain. When we talk about, remember the, the types of proteins that we called cytoskeleton proteins that give a cell its shape, they're gonna have more than one amino acid chain. So quaternary structure, whenever you hear that word, you're just thinking multiple amino acid chains. Hemoglobin, one example, but not the only protein with quaternary structure. In our debate here, when we were working on, on answering this question, we decided that this was not quaternary structure because there is only one amino acid chain here. So if we followed it, it kind of loops around and folds on itself. We, we do have a 3D structure here with one chain, so it's not quaternary structure. Now I did hear some interesting discussion that I liked about secondary structure. Can you remind me in the chat, there's two kinds of secondary structures for proteins. What are those two kinds of secondary structures? Two kinds, secondary structure. I'm making you type weird words today, aren't I? <laughs> So, so the first one are those alpha helices, and the second one are those things called beta sheets. Secondary structure happens when a part of our amino acid chain folds in on itself, either in those alpha helices that kind of look like the ribbon you put on birthday presents, or beta sheets that kind of look like an accordion. So we had some good discussion that, that we do kind of almost see like a, a beta sheets type pattern going on here. Um, so in that regard, it could potentially be secondary structure as well. Uh, so either of, of these answers could be correct. What I'll tell you is I'm not gonna put a question like this on your homework assignment or on the exam where, where it's up in the air that it could be either of these. The big idea with this question is I wanted to make sure that we knew the difference between secondary structure, tertiary structure, and quaternary structure. So as long as you can define what these structures are, if you can make a case for this being a secondary structure, like telling me it's a beta sheet, I'm sold because you know what secondary structure is. Or if you wanna tell me that it's the overall 3D shape of a protein, so it's tertiary structure, I'm sold. So just make sure we know what these types of structures mean. If we can describe it, we're good. And this last question on here, this is uh, what I like to say is an underline highlight star word. Uh, do whatever you need to do in your notes to remind yourself that this word is important. So the word is denatured. When a protein becomes denatured, it has permanently lost its shape. And the emphasis here is on the permanently because we know about lots of types of proteins that change their shape. Um, we talked about a type of channel proteins that change their shape. What are some of those, uh, well, tra let's do tra say transport proteins in general. Um, so let's start with the kind of protein that is open on the outside, then it's open on the inside, open on the outside, then on the inside, 
Yeah, Nicole mentioned the, those ones that open on the outside, then the inside, and they attach to what they're transporting are the ones we call carrier proteins. When I talk about channel proteins, uh, we had two types of channels, leakage channels and gated channels. Which of those uh, changes the shape of, of the protein to determine whether it's open or closed? Whether or not it's going to let stuff in? Gated or leakage? Who's not always open? To put it another way. Yeah, gated channels are not always open. I have to open the gate, which is a small change in the shape of the protein. I open the gate to let things get inside. But remember my biggest difference between a carrier protein and a channel protein is that carrier proteins attach to what they're transporting. So a, a chemically gated channel, when it attaches to a chemical, changes its shape a little bit to open up the gate. When an electrically, uh, or excuse me, a voltage gated channel, when the, the charge on the membrane changes a little bit, it, it opens the gate, it, it changes the shape of the protein some. Or when we have those mechanically gated channels, when we push on them, I change their shape just a little bit to open them up. But each of those types of gated channels, it's not a permanent change. So keep in mind that, that things do change their shape in the body sometimes, but if it's a permanent change in shape, that's not good. We are denatured. Hey, there's a couple reasons denatured is bad. Can we think of in the chat um, any of the reasons why a protein being denatured is not a good thing? What are some thoughts about why denatured proteins are bad? Okay, so our first idea about why they're bad is, is denatured proteins can denature other proteins. That's Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease, right? So we, yeah, we bump into another protein and we denature it too. We completely change its 3D shape. That's problematic. Hey, let's think even more basic too. Yeah, so if, if I lose my 3D shape, what word in the name of our class, which word in the name of our class represents the 3D shape of a protein? What's the, the structure of something called? What's that word? We're really nervous. I promise we don't have to be nervous. The shape of something, the structure of something is anatomy. If I permanently lose my anatomy, what does that mean about my physiology? Can I still do my job if I lose my shape? Yeah, I lose, I lose my job too, right? My, my function no longer works if I don't have the right shape. So denatured proteins are problematic first because they can't do their job. But second, because if they go through and they denature other proteins, then suddenly nobody can do their job. And that can lead your cells to die. And that's what happens in that condition that you guys read about, creutzfeldt jakobs disease. We get some proteins that are denatured, and they go through and denature other proteins, and suddenly we've got all of these proteins in the cell that can't do their job, um, and they, they end up killing the cell. And it's particularly bad because we're talking about brain cells. What's the fancy name for brain cells, by the way? What are the names of the cells in your brain? Yeah, your, your brain cells are called neurons. So if we denature or permanently remove the 3D shape of proteins in your brain cells, in your neurons, that's bad news. We're going to see a whole lot of, of issues with that. So we hit on a lot of the topics from lesson number five here. Hopefully it was, was a good review for you. Before I move on to lesson number six, um, help me out in the chat. What questions do we still have? Or shoot me an emoji if you feel good. Any last minute questions? 
for emojis. I'll send you my emoji. Okay, so there's a question in the chat. Will quaternary structure always have four different amino acid chains? No. Um, sometimes it's more than four. Sometimes it's less than four. It's always at least two. So as long as I have more than one amino acid chain, that's quaternary structure. Uh, but yeah, we have some proteins in the body that are made of 20, 30 different amino acid chains that all have to come together. If we're doing a really complex function, we can have way more than four. Good question. I'm feeling real nervous, guys. I got one emoji and one question. Maybe we're distracted today. Can I get any more emojis? Is there any more love for Dr. Aulis? There we go. Got a couple more. Uh, Nicole asked, uh, is it the cytoskeleton that connects to other cells? We will talk a little bit more about connecting cells together in lesson number seven in our next lesson about the skin. Um, the cytoskeleton, I wouldn't say that's its main job. Um, that's more going to be proteins that are embedded in the membrane as opposed to the, the proteins that are, are inside. Uh, it was a question on the homework. Um, maybe stick around at the end of class and I can pull that up and see. Um, Cause I am not remembering off the top of my head. Is that cool, Nicole? Can we, okay, good. We'll, we'll chat about it after, uh, after class. Yeah, so we'll look at yeah, we'll look at that that question after class. The good news is I don't have to rush off right at 11 today. So we have some extra time. <laughs> okay, well, what I want to do um, is I want to chat about some of the beginning ideas of lesson number six, I want to try to get you guys started on lesson number six because there's a lot of kind of um, activities or practice for you to do on lesson number six. Um, this portion of, of content on the exam that we'll be taking uh, in a few weeks when we take our next lecture exam, I will ask you to do um, kind of some application activities in the sense of I'm gonna make you do transcription, I'm gonna make you do translation, I'm gonna make you actually do the processes we're talking about today and the stuff we'll talk about on Thursday. So please try to continue working when we finish our class today to get all the way through lesson six to get you ready for Thursday, just so you know what kinds of questions to ask me on Thursday. What we are talking about in lesson number six is called the central dogma. Let me type that for you. It's, it's the name of your lesson, the central dogma. That sounds super weird, and I'm not going to ask you to define it on the test or anything, but there's this idea of a central dogma is that we have in our cells DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. Uh, this is what stores your genetic information in your body. We use that DNA to help us make things called polypeptides. Polypeptides is a fancy word for proteins. Hey, we can figure this out. Polypeptide. What do you think this name means? Any guesses? Poly means many. What is this part referring to? This peptide part of its name. Polypeptide. Yeah, those, those protein bonds, right? We, we call them peptide bonds. So a polypeptide, let's do some typing here. Poly means many. Peptide means peptide bonds. Polypeptide, many peptide bonds. 
the only thing, remember, we said the, the only kind of, of molecule that has peptide bonds are proteins. So the central dogma says, I'm starting with DNA, I'm ending with proteins. To go from DNA to proteins, I'm going to have to do two processes. I have to do two steps. So I start with the first step called transcription and maybe make a note for yourself in case you haven't worked on this yet in the lesson. When I do the process of transcription, my goal is to turn DNA into mRNA. That's the goal of transcription. I'll type it for us. DNA into mRNA. That's what transcription does. But mRNA is not a protein. It's not the same thing. It's speaking a different language, if you will, than a protein is. That's why I have to do this process called translation. Translation is taking us from one language, that language is nucleic acids, into another language, that language is proteins. So in the process of translation, we go from mRNA to proteins. mRNA to proteins. That's the process of translation. So the central dogma, that, that's the big picture. The central dogma is how I take your genetic information that, that's in your cell and use it to build proteins. Hey, can you guys remind me in the chat, where do I find DNA in a cell? Where is DNA normally found? Exactly. DNA is normally found in the nucleus. Hey, I, I read a lot of current events in anatomy that talked about the other location. We sometimes find DNA in the cell. Did anyone read that article about one other place the cell has DNA? Yeah, so there, there's one other place in the cell that we actually have a little bit of DNA and that place is called a mitochondria. Um, it, what, what's the normal function when you think of the mitochondria? What, is, what does the mitochondria normally do? What's its job normally? Yeah, so normal job of the mitochondria is to make ATP. That's what, what you're learning it as. Uh, but the mitochondria does actually have some DNA inside of it. Um, and what the article about about the mitochondria and its DNA was talking about is uh, we're not in a genetics class. You could take genetics uh, in, in the future. Um, there are things called mitochondrial diseases where your mitochondria doesn't work as well as it's supposed to. And a lot of that can come from the fact that there's problems with the DNA in the mitochondria. Normally, this DNA that's in the mitochondria only comes from your mom or at least that's what has been the major idea in science, that all your mitochondrial DNA comes from mom. But this article in, in the current events folder, so you can go back and read it, it's not too long, um, talks about how there was a boy who was having a mitochondrial disease, his mom didn't have it, and they were trying to figure out how that happened. Well, it, they figured out that he got some of his mitochondrial DNA from his dad, so here's a word that popped up in, in a lot of, of people's summaries here, and I'm not going to test you on this word, but I'm going to throw it out there. This word is called heteroplasmy. Just means that you got mitochondrial DNA from mom and dad. Normally, we thought it was all mom, but actually we're seeing that it could be a mix of mom and dad. So a little outside of the scope of, of when we're talking about central dogma, we're not really talking about... Um, the the process that we're using to do to transcribe our, our mitochondrial DNA all the time. But there is one other place in the cell that has DNA besides the nucleus. And that place is is the mitochondria. So if that was at all interesting to you, there's a short article in um, the current events in anatomy uh, article vault, whatever we want to call it, where you guys found your articles. You could read that about that that boy with a mitochondrial disease. Normally, Sorry, bunny trail there. So normally when we think about DNA, we are thinking about DNA being in the nucleus. DNA being in the nucleus is a good thing because that keeps it safe. 
So we keep our DNA in the nucleus. It's safe. Nothing is, is going to damage it. Nothing's going to break it apart. It, it's perfectly safe inside the nucleus. When we think about proteins in our cell, the vast majority of the proteins in your cell are not found in the nucleus. Most of them are found inside that soupy stuff of the cell. What was the name of the soupy stuff that I find floating around inside the cell? Yeah, so, so Gloria's right. The soupy stuff, oh perfect, some more of us chiming in too. Soupy stuff is called the cytosol. The cytosol, the, the soup inside your cell, it's, remember, the one intracellular fluid. So here, here's the, the big idea. Your DNA lives inside the nucleus. Remember from lab that the nucleus has its own membrane around it. It's called the nuclear envelope. DNA chilling out inside the nucleus. Proteins chilling out outside of the nucleus because the cytosol is found outside the nucleus. For me to be able to, to get proteins where I need them, which is in that soupy stuff, I need the message that's stored in the nucleus in my DNA, I need that to leave the nucleus. So for me to be able to get my message about what I'm building out of the nucleus to where I build it to make my proteins, that's the goal of this process called transcription. So in the process of transcription, we said that we turn DNA into mRNA. The reason this is helpful is because mRNA can leave the nucleus. mRNA can leave the nucleus. So the message of, of what protein I want to build, I get that out to where I build those proteins and where the proteins live by building this message here in the middle called MA. So DNA stores the instructions. mRNA takes those instructions out of the nucleus into the cytosol. And once those instructions are in the cytosol, I go through this process called translation where I turn them from a message into a protein. So mRNA is a message. My proteins are what I actually want to build. A uh, question in the chat, mRNA is just instructions. Uh, there's no DNA in it. That, that's correct. So DNA and, and RNA are two different things. Um, we, we said something in the guided lesson about mRNA. Um, so you'll see this, um, well, you'll, actually you'll see it in the context we used the word genes for this. When you think about mRNA, um, always consider that mRNA is the specific instructions for the particular protein that you're building. So this is a, a definition that's very similar to when, when you're working on the lesson, what we say a gene is. A gene is the specific instructions for a particular protein that, that you want to build. Your DNA has instructions to build every single protein that you have in your body. We do not always want to build every single protein that you have in your body. We only want to build particular proteins. So if I'm a red blood cell, I want to build hemoglobin all the time. If I'm a neuron, I do not want to build hemoglobin. That's worthless to me. I'd be building a protein that I'd never use. So I'm not going to copy those particular instructions for hemoglobin. Even though they're in my DNA, I'm not going to copy those instructions. I'm going to use instructions for, for example, chemically gated channels. Those channels that we talked about that neurotransmitters uh, attach to, neurons love those. They build those proteins all the time. When we're talking about a red blood cell, probably not going to build those chemically gated channels. So the, the follow-up question was, does every cell have all the DNA? The answer to that is yes. All the cells in your body have the, the DNA to do every single function. If they did every single function, that would be problematic. We would waste so much energy. We'd build so much stuff we don't need. So we take our, our DNA that has directions for everything and turn it into RNA, 
which is the stuff that we actually want. Once we have those directions just for the stuff that we want, we'll turn that into the proteins that we want. So it'll help us to save energy so we don't build a whole bunch of stuff that we don't need. That, that's kind of what happens in transcription. We find what we're looking for and we use that to build the protein that we want. I got one thumbs up. Any other thumbs up or other questions about what we just mentioned here? For the sake of my curiosity, um, I'm going to pop up here a picture from your lesson. This picture is an analogy for transcription and translation. If you had a chance to work this far in the lesson, can you click that little raise hand icon for me? Just so I know if any of us have talked about this so far or have looked at this so far. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I got two of us that have looked at it. That's fine. Um, it's early in the week, right? We just finished our, our first lesson. So to, to help you understand the difference between uh, transcription and translation or why we would need to have these processes, I, I gave you kind of a dated analogy. But this dated analogy that we're looking at right here um, helps us to understand what happens in the process of transcription transcription. Okay, so my two friends who have had a chance to do this lesson, I want you guys to not answer my questions now. I'm going to put you guys on mute and we're going to we're going to see if we can figure this out for my friends who haven't done this part of the lesson yet. First question, and I know you can answer this cuz we just talked about it on the previous slide. What happens in transcription? What does transcription do? You can totally look at your notes. No shame. Okay, so the process of transcription and I apologize, I'm going to say your name wrong. Maybe you can correct me. Um, is it is it Jaqual? Jaquala? can you help me out? I want to say it right. I'm so sorry. Can you turn on your mic and tell me? Maybe not. It's, no, it's Jaquel, but Jackie is fine. Jackie, okay. I, I want to make sure I, I say it correctly. I apologize. <laughs> Thank okay. you for telling me. Um, yeah, so, so Jackie is absolutely right here. When we talk about transcription, the process of transcription is when we is the first half of the central dogma. Transcription is when you take DNA and you turn it into mRNA. Take DNA, turn it into mRNA. That's the process of transcription. We talked about a difference in the location of DNA compared to mRNA. Why was mRNA good? What can mRNA do that DNA can't do? Or maybe, where can mRNA go that DNA can't? Yeah, there we go. We got, we got some answers here mRNA can leave the nucleus. Does DNA leave the nucleus? Yeah, I don't, I don't find DNA out there. So DNA cannot leave the nucleus. The process of transcription is turning DNA into mRNA. The reason I need to do this is because mRNA can't leave the nucleus. Now, back in the day, I am not this old, by the way, um, but back in the day when people wore clothes like this, and this is what a copier machine looked like, what a Xerox looked like, 
Back in that day, one of the primary sources for information in the world was not the internet. It was things like we see over here. So this over here, and for all my, my young friends, you may not even know what this is. Uh, this over here is called Encyclopedia Britannica. Britan I'm going to spell it wrong. Let me look at the picture. Britannica. Here we go. Encyclopedia Britannica used to be the internet. It used to be the source of all knowledge about all things. So it was a big group of encyclopedias that talked about every single topic um, that there was information to be had about. So I listed some of my favorite topics for you in the guided lesson, things that when I was in elementary school that I could have used these things for. I will add to the list of topics that I could have studied using Encyclopedia Britannica, my favorite friend, the penguins. So let's say I'm in second grade and I'm doing a book report or I'm doing a project about penguins. I look at this big Encyclopedia Britannica here. It's got all the information in the world. Um, it's got information about cows. It's got information about monkeys. It's got information about zebras. I only care about penguins. Remember how when, when we were talking about your cell's DNA, you've got directions to build every single protein. Yeah, so, so think about these encyclopedias like your DNA. You've got directions for everything, or there's information about everything in these books. I don't care about everything. I care about penguins. So I'm going to go to Encyclopedia Britannica, and I'm going to find the, the part on the shelf. I'm going to find the book that's letter P, and I'm going to open up that book, and I'm going to flip uh, past or in front of things like a platypus. I'm going to gonna see things like the pH scale. I'm going to see all kinds of things that aren't penguins. I'm going to keep looking and looking until I find penguins. And then I'm going to take that page that has penguins and has information about penguins. And I'm going to go over to the Xerox machine that looks like this on times. And I'm just going to copy that page that has information about penguins. Because see, I'm going to make that copy, that piece of paper. I'm going to take that with me when I leave the library to go write my book report by hand because it's second grade, right? I gotta, gotta write it by myself, gotta draw my own pictures, but I can't take Encyclopedia Britannica home with me. The library lets me check out a lot of books. They're not gonna let me check out this because this is the source of all knowledge. It's gotta stay in the library. So I make a photocopy of the information I want about penguins and I take that with me out of the library. So let's see if you guys can help me out in the chat. Again, not my friends who've done this already. When I think about this example, we said that the encyclopedias, let me type the one we've already answered. The encyclopedias are like your cell's DNA. Hey, what would be, uh, what thing in the cell would the library be like? Any thoughts? What might the library represent in your cell? Yeah, so the library is going to represent the nucleus of your cell. Think about this. The encyclopedias, they live in the library. Your DNA lives in the nucleus. The encyclopedias can't leave the library. The DNA can't leave the nucleus. So we've got a library which is the nucleus of the cell that stores all kinds of books, encyclopedias in particular. That's like your DNA. That DNA can't leave the nucleus or those encyclopedias can't leave the, the library. But what can leave the library are our photocopies. Those photocopies that I made on my Xerox machine, what might those represent? If the encyclopedias are the DNA, what's those copies of the pages that, I, that I'm looking for? Yeah, th those copies represent the mRNA, <clears throat> the mRNA. So let's re review our analogy here. And after class today, you can go through and read it again to let it soak in. We have a library 
in, in the city. I actually live pretty close to the library. Pre-pandemic, we spent a lot of time there because my daughter's a big reader. Not of encyclopedias yet, but maybe one day. <laughs> so, got a library. That library's got some really special books that it won't check out. You want the information in those books, so you gotta make a photocopy. Or, I guess in the day and age of now, right, we use our cell phone, take a quick picture of the information we want. Okay, let's turn this into a cell. You've got a place in your cell, the nucleus, that has all the information that your cell could ever need. That's your DNA. I don't need all of that information all the time, but the information I want can't leave the nucleus. DNA can never leave. So I make this copy called mRNA, and I shoot it out of the nucleus and into the cytosol to allow me to use it to write my book report, or in this case, to build a protein. The, the process of transcription can kind of be symbolized in, in this encyclopedias and, and the library example. So let me see my question. In all the lesson, it has just RNA, uh, not mRNA, but it makes a difference. So um, in general, Jacqueline, it, it, it is different. And I'll, I'll talk about our different kinds of RNA. Um, but the only kind of RNA that we're really focusing on this semester is mRNA. So the reason that, that it just says that it's RNA um, is because that's the main kind I want you to consider. Gloria asked about the copy machine. So we need to do a little bit more discussion about transcription to help us figure out what the copy machine is. So good question that we will answer together here in just a moment. Any other quick questions? I want to show you So um, let's start with Jacqueline's question really fast. Jacqueline said the notes talk about RNA and you've seen today I'm really using mRNA. The most common kind of RNA in your cell is something called mRNA. So when we look inside your cell, the thing that sends messages, that's why it's called a messenger RNA, mRNA sends messages that's what I make when I'm copying my DNA. I turn it into a message. That's called mRNA. In the cell, there are also technically two other kinds of RNA. One of those kinds of RNA is called rRNA, ribosomal RNA. Hey, not a trick question. Where in the cell are you going to see ribosomal RNA? promise it's not a trick question. Yeah, ribosomal RNA is inside ribosomes. So that's the ribosomes that float around in the cytosol. And it's the ribosomes, like Jackie mentioned, that are seen on the rough ER. So anywhere I've got ribosomes, there's a special kind of RNA inside of it. Um, honestly, we're really not going to focus on our RNA this semester. The other kind of, of RNA that we're going to care a little bit more about is, is what we call transfer RNA, tRNA, or in the guided lesson, you will hear me call it one other thing, that T standing for one other thing, and this is just Dr. Aulis's word for it. It's not actually uh, what science calls it. Um, I like to, to think of tRNA as translator RNA. tRNA is involved in the process called translation where I turn my mRNA message into a protein. tRNA acts like a translator because half of it is made of nucleotides, the message kind of stuff, and half of it is made of amino acids, the stuff that proteins are made out of. So the, the two kinds that we most care about this semester, mRNA, which is the messages that can leave the nucleus, and this kind called tRNA, which is a translator. That translator helps us to turn a message into a functional protein. 
But as, as was pointed out in the chat, you're going to see a lot of discussion in the lesson just referring to RNA. Consider that in the lesson when we just talk about RNA, we're probably talking about mRNA. This is the most common kind. Um, we're pretty much never going to talk about rRNA. We will talk about tRNAs, though. So three kinds of RNA in the cell. Messenger one, that leaves the nucleus. Ribosomal one, that's inside the ribosome. And then transfer or translator RNA that helps us to turn a message into a protein. Three types of RNA. We had the question, let me see if I can find the best picture for this, uh, about the copy machine, what the copy machine was. Um, to help us answer that question, let me briefly talk about this. What we're looking at here is deoxyribonucleic acid compared to ribonucleic acid. Hey, I promise this is not a trick question. There's a way easier name for this right here, deoxyribonucleic acid. What would be the easy name? Deoxyribonucleic acid. Yeah, so deoxyribo, that's D. Nucleic is N. Acid is A, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. So ribonucleic acid is the full name for RNA, RNA. Deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, this is the kind of genetic information that you guys now know to death. We're really familiar with where in the cell it's found. Where do I have deoxyribonucleic acid again? Where's the normal place for DNA? Yeah, DNA is normally inside the nucleus. That's where it lives. It doesn't leave. It's inside the library. It's stuck there. Ribonucleic acid, uh, RNA, we talked about a few different places that we find it. So when I'm talking about mRNA, my messenger RNA, that goes into the cytosol, that leaves the nucleus, goes into the cytosol. When I'm talking about rRNA, that's found where? Where's rRNA? Anyone remember what that R stood for? Yeah, R was ribosomal RNA. Ribosomal RNA is inside ribosomes. I guess I'll put underneath it in parentheses, rRNA, inside ribosomes. That this, the kind that's in the cytosol, that's going to be mRNA or tRNA. Those, those funky ones that were shaped like the letter T are found in the cytosol too, floating around in the soup. DNA versus RNA. One of your learning objectives is to compare them. So we're, we're doing a little comparison here together. So DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, is found inside the nucleus. RNA, ribonucleic acid, is found mostly inside the soup, mostly in the cytosol, but also inside some of those ribosomes. Hey, not a trick question. We have this terminology called single-stranded and double-stranded, meaning I've got one strand of genetic information or two strands of genetic information. Which of these, these types of genetic information, DNA or RNA, which of these looks like it is single-stranded? The word is single-stranded. Yeah, the, the one that is single-stranded, where there's just one set of genetic information, that is RNA, single-stranded. Single-stranded meaning I have one set of, of information. See how there's one line of all of these little nucleotides, by the way. So here, let me type that word, nucleotides. We mentioned it earlier in the lesson. 
monomers of nucleic acids. Each of these little symbols that you see right here represent a nucleotide, a small piece of a nucleic acid. So ribonucleic acid, RNA, is single-stranded. It's got one line or a single line of nucleotides. When I talk about DNA, the thing that's found inside the nucleus, I actually store that in a pattern called double-stranded. Double-stranded. Double-stranded means I have two sets of genetic information. So you can see over here my blue strand of genetic information that is attached to my, my red strand of genetic information that I see over here. Double-stranded. I have two strands of genetic information. Here's an idea to keep kind of in the back of, of your mind. Double-stranded genetic information is very stable. It's not going to fall apart. Single-stranded, not stable. It's going to fall apart. It doesn't last very long. Now, this is a good thing for your cell ultimately because when we send a message, when we do mRNA, we want that message to be heard only when we send it. We don't want it to keep being heard over and over and over again. Otherwise, we're going to start building some proteins that are really useless to our cell because we're hearing a message that we sent five minutes ago. So mRNA, my messages that leave the nucleus, they're not very stable. They don't last very long. Your DNA is double-stranded. It's very stable. It's not going to fall apart which again is a good thing for you, right? We don't want our genetic information that stores all the instructions for everything to just fall apart on us. DNA, double-stranded inside the nucleus. RNA, single-stranded. A lot of it in that soupy stuff, some of it inside ribosomes. Hey, one other important difference, which is why these molecules have a different name, is that beginning part. In their name. So DNA is called deoxyribonucleic acid. RNA is called ribonucleic acid. These molecules get their name from the kind of sugar that you find in this backbone right here. So attaching together each of our nucleotides, each of the information pieces, is sugar. That's what this gray line or this beige line represents here is a type of sugar. Same thing with the blue, we've got sugar, and the red, that's sugar. The names of those sugars are different. So in RNA, we have what's called ribose. Oh, I spelled that wrong. Let's try again. Ribose sugar. Ribose sugar. That's why it's called ribonucleic acid. In DNA, we have deoxy ribose sugar deoxy ribose that's why it's called deoxy ribonucleic acid these two sugars deoxy ribose sugar and ribose sugar the only thing that makes them different their chemical structure is exactly the same except that deoxy ribose has lost something d means i've lost something what do you think this oxy part means I've lost. Yeah, deoxy means there's an oxygen missing. Deoxyribose sugar has one less oxygen than ribose sugar does. And it sounds like that wouldn't be a big deal to just have one less oxygen, but it actually is a really big deal when we're thinking about how stable these different sugars are, and when we're thinking about the kinds of nucleotides that attach to them. When I have deoxyribose sugar, here's the symbols for the types of nucleic acids that I can uh, attach to it. So these types of, of nucleic acids here, you don't have to know their full names, you just need to know their abbreviations. We have four nucleotide bases. Let me write that word on here. Nucleotides. My monomers, right? 
my monomers of, of DNA and RNA. When we talk about DNA, the four monomers or the four pieces that we can have are listed right here. A, which stands for adenine, T, which stands for thymine, C, which stands for cytosine, and G, which stands for guanine. Okay, fun fact, you know your teacher is a nerd. I'm gonna take my nerdiness to a new level here. I literally have a cat whose name is Adenine, no joke. We call her Addie, um, so I have a cat named Adenine. She's only Adenine when she's naughty. She's normally just Addie, um, but I have a cat named Adenine, so there you go. If I ever get another cat, I'm gonna to have to name that cat Thymine because Adenine and Thymine play nice with each other. They attach to each other. Um, the other thing, though, that I could name a cat, if I get another cat, would be uracil. So when we talk about RNA, when we talk about the, the type of genetic information made with ribose sugar, um, we still have adenine. We still have A. I joke that that's my favorite nucleotide, right, because I have a cat named that. We still have cytosine, we still have C. We still have guanine, that's G. But we do not have thymine. There's no T, we have uracil instead. That is an underline highlight star thing for you to write in your notes. RNA, mRNA in particular, that's the one we really care about. mRNA has uracil, it does not have thymine. Say it again. mRNA has uracil, it does not have thymine. I know there was a question in the chat, uh, would we still consider these nucleotides? Yes, these are still nucleotides, and three of them are exactly the same cytosine, adenine, guanine, those are in both kinds of genetic information. But uracil, U is how we would abbreviate it, uracil, that's only seen in RNA. T, thymine, only seen in DNA. So again, we, we could highlight for ourselves the two most important nucleotides to help us know if we're looking at DNA or RNA. If you see T's, you're looking at DNA. If you see U's, you're looking at RNA. Remember how we talked about the difference between ribose and deoxyribose is that one oxygen? That one oxygen makes so much of a difference that thymine says, forget this, like I, I can't be around oxygen. Ribose sugar has, has that extra oxygen. Thymine's like, uh, no, can't even. So deoxyribose is the only kind of sugar that thymine plays nice with. Uracil does just fine with that extra oxygen. So uracil is with ribose sugar. Thymine is with deoxyribose sugar. Important differences between DNA and RNA. We highlighted a bunch of them. Their location is different. The fact that we're double-stranded compared to single-stranded is different. The kind of sugar that we find in, in the backbone, making those ribbons, that's different. And the names of the nucleotides that, that are in these bases, that's different too. So important differences between DNA and RNA for us to be familiar with. In the chat, Help me out. Thumbs up or what questions do we still have? <laughs> Jacqueline's mind is blown. Love it. Gloria's happy. Got a couple of thumbs ups. I have a friend. Let me check and see. Yeah, she's not here this morning. Kai usually gives me the little dancing person. She's not here today. 
so the question is, so all RNA is pretty much similar. Um, yes, yeah, so so these these statements that we talked about, things like where we find it, what it's made from, those those bases. Yes, all of my types of RNA are that way. Um, we when, when we're thinking about questions about RNA, most of them are going to refer to mRNA in general. Uh, but if I'm asking you more specifically about tRNA or rRNA, you will see that extra letter there. So. If I want you to tell me where I find rRNA, that's different than, than mRNA, right? So rRNA is the one that's in the ribosomes. tRNA, mRNA, in cytosol. Primarily, though, our lesson is focusing on mRNA. OK, let me talk with you about an idea that's specific to DNA. Oh, first here, let's have a little, a little nerd moment together here. I like this cartoon, so I gotta share it. So over here on the left, we see some DNA. Over here on the right, we've got a couple of mRNA strands, including Arthur. This is Arthur over here. So Arthur, the mRNA strand says, I'm telling you, Carol, I'm done being this guy's messenger boy. He can leave the nucleus and do it himself for all I care. So that's how Arthur feels about DNA. Can you guys help me out in the chat? Why is this funny? Or why does this make sense? Why is it accurate? It's probably only funny to Dr. Aulis, right? Because I'm a nerd. Or let's put it another way. What facts do we see in here that are correct? Yeah, so first fact that we see, right, is that DNA can't leave the nucleus. So we say he can leave the nucleus and do it himself, right? Well, actually, he can't. mRNA is the only thing that can leave the nucleus, right? So our DNA friend over here, he's not just lazy. He legitimately can't leave the nucleus. Only our mRNA friends can, especially Arthur, who's, who's just done. He can't even, right? Hey, hey, maybe right now in our lives, we're all kind of like DNA, right? Like we can't leave our house. <laughs> our, our self, the person that we were way back um, in March, right? Maybe the person we were in March got tired of leaving the house. And then suddenly we had to turn into this DNA person that never gets to leave. <laughs> oh, yeah, Gloria made a good point, too. Um, when we're talking about Arthur and Carol down here, we're both we're seeing that both of them are single stranded. So that's another good correlation, too. So we got we got single stranded going on. Let me type that single stranded. And we've got this comment about the, the DNA leaving the nucleus. So um, this, by the way, is, is made by I'm not sure if I include many of these videos in there, but there's a, a group called the Amoeba Sisters. Amoeba Sisters. I'm not sure if, if you guys have heard of them or if I've included any of their videos in the guided lessons, but if you want a, a fun way, oh, perfect. It's in lesson six. Awesome. Um, they, they are a fun way to review things. They do cartoons. So this is one of, one of their cartoons. I, I stole it from them. Um, but the Amoeba Sisters with, with angry Arthur and Carol down here that are tired of, of leaving the nucleus. So just a little fun thing, fun for Dr. Aulis at least, right? It's like a dad joke, right? You just got to groan and put up with it. Let's talk about really fast that double stranded thing in DNA. So over here on the left, you see that DNA picture we already talked about. In the middle of DNA, we can see all of those nucleotides that, that we talked about, A's, T's, G's, and C's. When we talk about the fact that DNA is double stranded, it's got two strands, there's a word that I want you to underline, highlight star. That word is complementary. The word is complementary. This word complementary means that the sequence of one DNA strand, the blue one here, can be used to predict the sequence of the other strand, this red one that we see over here. So let me write that down. Complementary means one strand can be used to predict the other. 
one strand can be used to predict the other, the sequence of one strand. What complementary also means is that the two strands have different, different sequences. They are not the same. I can use them to predict the sequence of each other, but they're not exactly the same. The way that I tell you in, in the guided lesson to think about this is like a mirror image. So you look at yourself in the mirror and what's the left side of you on your body looks like the right side and vice versa. It, it's opposite. It's a reflection of you. So think about one strand of DNA as, as being our, our main strand and the mirror image of that strand is the other one that, that it's attached to. What that means in the nitty gritty when I'm applying the fact that DNA is complementary, that means that every time you see an A in one of your DNA strands, the other DNA strand is going to have a T. So it's complementary. It's not the same, but I can predict it. Every time I see an A, the other strand is going to have a T. Every time I see a T, the other strand is going to have an A. They're complementary to each other. Same thing down here with C and G. Every time you see a C in one strand of DNA, the other strand is going to have a G. And every time I see a G, the other strand is going to have a C. So when you think about the sequences of a DNA molecule, the fact that it has two strands, if you know the sequence of one strand of DNA, you can predict the sequence of the other strand of DNA because they are complementary to each other. Again, underline, highlight, star, really important word, complementary. Not the same, but mirror images. You have this picture in your notes, and let me tell you up front, I promise that I'm not going to give you a picture of the chemistry of adenine and ask you to identify it. I promise I will not do that. I will not give you a picture of cytosine and ask you to identify it or guanine or thymine. I didn't include this picture to make you memorize chemistry. The reason I included this picture was to show you a couple of things. First thing that I included it to show you is to show you that what holds together my two strands of DNA is hydrogen bonds. Hey, hydrogen bonds, can you help me out in the chat? What are some of the things we know about hydrogen bonds? What do we know about hydrogen bonds? Anything and everything. You can tell me what we remember. Okay. So uh, Jackie noted that they form because of dipoles. Yeah, so um, let me pull up my chat here. So uh, when, we, when we talk about hydrogen bonds, they are due to dipoles. Dipoles form when, when we've got an attraction, or sorry, when we have dipoles, we can form an attraction between them. So we're always going to see a hydrogen involved, right? That's why they got their name. Hydrogen bonds have hydrogens. It's when the hydrogen is attracted to something else typically a nitrogen or an oxygen. That's usually what those attractions are to. We have a positive dipole around these hydrogens. We have a negative dipole around these oxygens and nitrogens. Remember, negative dipole means I see the oxygens more, or I see the electrons more often. So negative, we see them more often around nitrogen and oxygen. We see them less often around these hydrogens. Hydrogen is not as electronegative. So it's slightly positive. These guys are slightly negative. The attraction between those dipoles forms this hydrogen bond thing. And Gloria is absolutely right. It's kind of weak compared to other types of bonds. This is not a super strong bond. That being said, the fact that your DNA has so many of these hydrogen bonds, keep in mind that your DNA is not just going to fall apart because I have so many of these hydrogen bonds holding it together, it will stay stuck together. So in general, if I just had like one set of hydrogen bonds trying to hold together DNA, probably not great. But the fact that you have so many, your DNA molecule stays put together there. So first thing to know, 
from this image, I use hydrogen bonds to hold my two halves of DNA together. Second thing to know, though, about this is the number of hydrogen bonds that I form is different between my types of nucleotides. So notice that T, thymine, over here in yellow, has one and two places to make a hydrogen bond. Adenine over here, my favorite nucleotide, right? Adenine over here has one and two places to make a hydrogen bond. So adenine and thymine, A and T, they have the same number of places to build hydrogen bonds. Because of that, they are complementary. They will attach to each other, A and T. If I look down here at guanine and cytosine, G and C, notice that guanine has one, two, three places to make a hydrogen bond, while cytosine has one, two, three as well. So these guys, C and G, attach to each other with three hydrogen bonds. Thymine and adenine attach to each other with two hydrogen bonds. Because they have different chemical structures, I can't ever attach a G to an A. I can't ever attach a T to a C or a C to an A. It's the number of hydrogen bonds that determines whether or not these things can connect to each other. So T and A always attach to each other. G and C always attach to each other. It comes down to their chemistry, to the structure of, of these these nucleotides. But again, 100%, I promise you, I am not going to ask you to identify a nucleotide based on its shape. I will ask you to tell me which nucleotide would attach to another one. So we do need to know that A's always attach to T's and G's always attach to C. But I promise I'm not going to make you identify these things that we see here. One last thing to mention on, on this picture here. These are my nucleotide bases in the middle, but see how it mentions the sugar phosphate backbone? Emphasis here on the sugar. Hey, we're talking about DNA. We're looking at a picture of DNA. I know it's a long word, but can you help me out in the chat? What would the name of this sugar be? What sugar did we say was in DNA? Yeah, hopefully we wrote it down in our notes. DNA has deoxyribose sugar. Deoxyribose sugar, that's the kind in DNA. So deoxyribose sugar on both sides here, and then those nucleotide bases that are in the middle. Remind me, what was the abbreviation for the nucleotide that I only find in RNA? What was its letter? Yeah, we only find that nucleotide called uracil or U when we're in RNA. So we would replace T, no T in RNA. There would be a uracil here instead. Thumbs up or questions? Where are we at? Um, Gloria says, I keep asking you to draw the strands. Uh, I'm not sure I need you to draw the strands as much as to predict the sequence. Uh, can you tell me what page in particular you're referring to? I can pull up the, the outline and, and see what you're talking about. Okay, page two, let's see. Okay, um, yeah, so when I talk about building the complementary strand, I'm just asking you to, to write the sequence. 
Yeah, so you don't have to draw anything. I mean, if you want to, you can, <laughs> but you don't have to draw anything for that one. Yeah, so underneath it, I, I left you a space for you to write what what the sequence of the other the other strand would be. So here, let me pull up because I have this um, this question here on a slide, and we'll probably do this together in in class next time. Here, um, here's the class. Here, here's the question that um, that Gloria is talking about here. So at the bottom of page two, I ask you to build the complementary DNA strand to the nucleotide sequence you see below. Here is a sequence. It's the list of or the order that our nucleotides are found in in a piece of DNA. What I'm asking you to do is to use the letters that you see right here to build what the letters would be in the complementary DNA strand. Remind me in the chat this word complementary, does complementary mean that they are the same or not the same? Complementary, the same or not the same? Yeah, they're not the same. They're the mirror image of each other. So when I'm, when I'm looking here at my, my sequence, I'm not gonna put a T in my complementary strand. I'm gonna put the thing that attaches to T who attaches to T? What's the, the nucleotide that, that binds to T? Yeah, A binds to T. So the first nucleotide in my complementary DNA strand is A, is adenine. Hey, which one binds to A? Not a trick question. Who do I attach to? Yeah, I attach to T. Okay. Who does C attach to? G, exactly. And then look at that, we've got a G right here, so we put a C. When I ask you to, to build the strands, I promise you don't have to draw. I 100% will make you draw. I just want you to write letters. <laughs> so we've gone through and done the first four letters on our complementary DNA strand. All I'm asking you to do is tell me what would the other strand look like? If I, if I had those letters, if these, this is my set of letters in one DNA strand. So let me go back to our pictures here. Oops, that's what I get for not looking at my picture. Okay, one minute. If, if I told you, so that list of letters that, that were on there, if that's the list of letters in the blue strand, I want you to tell me the list of letters in the red strand. I promise it is that easy. Yeah, some of us are saying in the notes, I make it way harder than it is. Totally get that. <laughs> I, I promise I, I might be a mean teacher, but I'm not that mean that I'm going to make you draw um, the, the sequence of things. So for that question there on page two, and then let me find uh, the next place I have you do something like that. That question on page six, um, I think we do it again down on page nine. Uh, I, I promise that you don't have to draw anything. Yeah, so don't, you know, I'm, this is not organic chemistry. So don't draw yourself those sugar groups. Don't draw those nucleic acids. I promise that is not a life skill I want you to learn in this class. So focus on, on knowing the difference between complementary, um, what's the same and what's different. Let me toss out, because we're going to wrap up here shortly. Um, let me toss out this question to on page, I think, okay, so this is the one on page six. I'm asking you to transcribe the DNA sequence. When we do the process of transcription, transcription, we said at the beginning, was turning DNA into mRNA turning DNA into mRNA. I have given you the DNA sequence right here. When you build an mRNA sequence from a DNA sequence, you're still building a complementary sequence. A complementary sequence. And I'm going to ask you the exact same question again. When we have a complementary sequence, the same or not the same? Complementary. The same or not the same? Only two of us feel confident. It is not the same. This word complementary means we're not the same. 
we are a mirror image, complementary things, mirror image of each other. Now, we are building a complementary mRNA strand. Remember that when we have mRNA, when we have that ribose sugar, one of our nucleotides from DNA can't be used anymore. Who is uh, the nucleotide that cannot be used in mRNA? Yeah, we can't put T in mRNA. We have to use U instead. So when we do transcription, we include U, not T. We include U and not T. That, that sounds like, I don't know. When I say not tea, I'm thinking like tea that you drink. I'm not a big tea person. We established this back with those, those YouTube examples, right? So we're including the letter U. We're not including sweet tea. I don't drink sweet tea. So if I were building DNA, what would be the base that I, I would attach to T? Who pairs with T normally? Yeah, T attaches to A. A is a base that we do have in RNA. Nothing changes. Hey, A in, in DNA attaches to what? If I'm in DNA, A attaches to, yeah, thymine, to T, right? But we're not, we're doing transcription now. So with transcription, I, I can't do T. I put U in its place. So anytime my DNA sequence has an A, if I'm turning that DNA into mRNA, if I'm turning it into an RNA strand, I can't put a T in there. I have to put a U because thymine says too much oxygen, I'm piecing out. I have to use uracil instead. So when I build a complementary mRNA strand, I do it exactly the same way that, that I would build a complementary DNA strand, but instead of putting in a T anytime that I have an A, I would put in a U in, in its place because I use uracil instead of thymine. So when you're going through and you're working on this lesson and it asks you to do transcription to build mRNA, or it asks you to build a complementary DNA strand. Make sure that you're watching what it's asking you to build. Because if I'm building RNA, I use uracil. If I'm building DNA, I use thymine instead. Otherwise, it's still complementary. It's still the mirror image. So still that, that a T would attach to an A or would cause us to put in an A, it's still that a C would cause us to put in G. We just have to do that, that switch on, on the U's and the T's. When I do transcription, I've got to put in the U and not the T. What other questions do we have? Got one thumbs up. I did not forget about there was a question uh, about the copier, and I did not forget about that. I, I'm gonna that's gonna be the thing we end on. Um, so Jacqueline asked, T will always um, transform to an A. Um, yeah, so when I, when I have T in one strand, I, I will always incorporate an A into the other strand. That's correct. So we're always, when we, when we build it, so um, when we're doing the process of transcription, taking one strain, uh, strand to make the other strand, I will always pair up T with an A every time. If I'm in DNA, an A goes to a e. If I'm in RNA, an A goes to a U. But T will always be with A. C will always be with G, G will always be with C. It's just when there's A in that first strand, 
you have to figure out whether we're putting in a U or a T, depending on what you're building, RNA or DNA. Uh, Gloria asked a question that I think we might be able to help each other out with here. What's the name of the sugar that I find in DNA? What was that DNA sugar called? Again, does anyone remember? DNA sugar. Yeah, deoxyribose. That's where we get the D from. Deoxyribose. But it's always good to, to clarify, even if, even if you knew it already. Okay, here's the last thing that I want to mention. We had the question what the copier machine was in, in that analogy for the process of transcription. The copier machine is the thing that turns your DNA, your double-stranded DNA, into RNA, the, the single-stranded message that's going to leave the nucleus. The thing in that analogy that represents the copier machine is an enzyme called RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase. Hey, this polymerase word has the, the word polymer in it. Remember way back at the beginning of class today, we talked about how there are monomers and there are polymers. So a polymerase enzyme, polymerase, makes polymers or it makes something. That's what polymerase means. It is an RNA polymerase, meaning that it builds RNA. So RNA polymerase builds RNA. That's its job. We will talk more on Thursday about how RNA polymerase, by the way, this is an enzyme that has lots of amino acid chains. So I can see it's got a few different parts to it. RNA polymerase. It's my copy machine that attaches to my encyclopedia at the specific area. Here's the information about penguins right here. Here's the information I want. My, I, I copy it on the copier. The copy machine copies this information that I want, spits out those copies that I can take out of the library called the RNA. So RNA polymerase is the enzyme that does the process of transcription. What we were looking at on that previous slide where I told you to transcribe the DNA sequence, you were acting like RNA polymerase. You were taking the sequence of the DNA strand and you were predicting the sequence of this RNA strand that I make based on it. So the process of transcription is done by RNA polymerase, turning DNA into RNA. That's the job of RNA polymerase. So that, that last part of our, our copier analogy uh, is, is what the copier is, and that, that is this enzyme RNA polymerase. Any last questions about what we've talked about in this lesson? I know we had some other questions that were related to homework, and I'll take some time for those, but any last minute questions about lesson six so far? Get your daily penguin going while we're thinking of questions. Or shoot me an emoji about how you're feeling. Doesn't have to be a happy emoji. How are we feeling? Look at the question here. Um, okay, of the guide lesson, I was looking at the, the worksheet and I was like, I'm not sure what you're referring to here. Let me pull up that lesson here. Is there um, a word missing or do you have a specific question about that? So I know what, what we're looking for here. 
I guess I was confused because it says not also the gene that explains how to build my myosin and uh -huh. I didn't know what not also the gene meant. Uh, so, so what that's saying is, and let me see what particular, is it talking, um, are we talking about hemoglobin in here by any chance? I haven't, I haven't read this one for, let me, I apologize. I made this activity way back in like March. Let's see. Yes. It's like directly after it's talking about hemoglobin. Okay. Um, yeah, so so the question for, for my friends that are watching via the video, um, the question is asking about on page six of the guided lesson, um, it, it talks about how a cell only wants directions um, from a, one particular gene, not also the directions from the gene that talks about how to build myosin. So we're talking about an example um, in red blood cells. So red blood cells, we, we mentioned at the beginning of class, they use the protein hemoglobin. They use it a, a whole lot. Does anyone remember? You can help me out in the chat here. What's the function of hemoglobin? What do red blood cells use hemoglobin to do in your body? Yeah, hemoglobin is all about oxygen transport. So red blood cells want the directions for how to build hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is, is the protein that helps them to transport oxygen. So when we're looking at a DNA molecule, I've got this region right here in yellow that, for example, ha holds the directions for how to build hemoglobin. The red blood cell is very interested in this information right here. But if we looked a little bit farther down the DNA strand, there would be another set of instructions, and these instructions help it to build the protein called myosin. Myosin is a protein that the cells uh, in your muscles really like because myosin helps them to do muscle contraction. But if I am a red blood cell, I don't care about myosin. I'm not contracting. I care about hemoglobin. So in the process of transcription, I only copy the directions for the protein I care about. So in the example, I'm only going to copy the directions for hemoglobin. I'm not also going to copy the directions down here. For, for myosin. I don't need that protein. I just need this protein. So the process of transcription allows a cell to just get the information it wants. Just the information about penguins, not the information about platypuses. So just the information about hemoglobin, not the information about myosin. Does that help with, with that question? The whole idea of transcription is just give me the instructions that I want and I need. That's, that's our approach to class, right? Just tell me the information I need to know about all the extra stuff. It's the way your cells are too. <laughs> Any other last minute questions about lesson six so far? Okay, well, as we wrap up today's talk about lesson number six, please do try to work through the rest of or work through all of lesson number six between now and Thursday, because uh, I really want and need you guys to bring me the specific kinds of questions that you have related to this material. Um, go through, we, we clarified a little bit together, right? When it talks about building particular sequences, no need to draw chemical structures. Um, just work on pairing up those bases that you see here with their complementary bases. So go through and, and work on hopefully all of the lessons to get through there. We're going to talk a lot more next time. We talked a lot today about transcription. We'll talk more about translation next time uh, and we'll actually talk through how to do translation. So try to use that lesson to, to do as much as you can and we will we'll wrap up this material when we're together again on Thursday.